without exposure to the alternative visions of the world expressed by other languages, our view of ourselves and of our planet remains inward-looking, unchallenged, and parochial. It is only by experiencing another language and culture, whether at home or abroad, that we discover the defining contours of our own. That is why it is important for the UN to affirm, and to keep on affirming, the principle of linguistic diversity as a basic human good. It fosters an intellectual and emotional climate in which triumphalist language attitudes and organizations feel increasingly uncomfortable and outmoded. Without exposure to the alternative visions of the world expressed by other languages, our view of ourselves and of our planet remains inward-looking, unchallenged, and parochial. It is only by experiencing another language and culture, whether at home or abroad, that we discover the defining contours of our own. That is why it is important for the UN to affirm, and to keep on affirming, the principle of linguistic diversity as a basic human good. It fosters an intellectual and emotional climate in which triumphalist language attitudes and organizations feel increasingly uncomfortable and outmoded. So a dialect can be broken down into different component parts, and if you just like to take a pen and paper, I'll, I'll give you a list of the most helpful ones which over the course of the year, we will look at in more detail. So, vowel changes that's the most obvious one. Consonant changes, two that's the intonation pattern of an accent. Key, whether somebody has a minor or a major accent. Rhythm, do they have a staccato accent? Is it more lyrical? Is it flowing? So a dialect can be broken down into different component parts, and if you just like to take a pen and paper, I'll, I'll give you a list of the most helpful ones which over the course of the year, we will look at in more detail. So, vowel changes that's the most obvious one. Consonant changes, two that's the intonation pattern of an accent. Key, whether somebody has a minor or a major accent. Rhythm, do they have a staccato accent? Is it more lyrical? Is it flowing? Have you got kids? You know anyone who does? They're a lot of work, right? Many people would tell you, including me. It's a full-time job. Either you look after them or you pay someone else to. It's around the clock. Now if you live in Australia, you have kids and you don't have an income or you're on minimum wage, give or take a few hundred dollars a week. You're entitled to some money from Centrelink. It's called the parenting payment. And if you get it, you might have to sign up to something called Parents Next. Maybe you've heard of it. Have you got kids? You know anyone who does? They're a lot of work, right? Many people would tell you, including me. It's a full-time job. Either you look after them or you pay someone else to. It's around the clock. Now if you live in Australia, you have kids and you don't have an income or you're on minimum wage, give or take a few hundred dollars a week. You're entitled to some money from Centrelink. It's called the parenting payment. And if you get it, you might have to sign up to something called Parents Next. Maybe you've heard of it. And the future, of course, lies somewhere in between those. 
It's not like it's black and white or shades of grey. But putting these extreme scenarios helps us tell the story and imagine what the futures are. And the four scenarios that we did in this study. I'm going to summarize briefly just because of time. The first one is something called the global orchestration. Global orchestration, I would summarize this word dominated by the United Nations. And the future, of course, lies somewhere in between those. It's not like it's black and white or shades of grey. But putting these extreme scenarios helps us tell the story and imagine what the futures are. And the four scenarios that we did in this study. I'm going to summarize briefly just because of time. The first one is something called the global orchestration. Global orchestration, I would summarize this word dominated by the United Nations. Essentially, what you really want to have happened is for the leaves to be producing lots of nutrients, sugars, and such, so that when they finally convert over to the dormant period, when they grow up a layer of cells and separates leaves, the rest of the tree known at the sun layer, there are plenty of sugars and nutrients trapped in that leaf so that as the chlorophyll fades and leaf loses their green color, there are plenty of other materials in there that give the leaves their color. Essentially, what you really want to have happened is for the leaves to be producing lots of nutrients, sugars, and such, so that when they finally convert over to the dormant period, when they grow up a layer of cells and separates leaves, the rest of the tree known at the sun layer, there are plenty of sugars and nutrients trapped in that leaf so that as the chlorophyll fades and leaf loses their green color, there are plenty of other materials in there that give the leaves their color. In terms of the, during the going season, when the temperatures are higher and plants are picking up water from the salt, that the total moisture loss from top soil layers, actually on adequate is much greater than what comes down the rainfall. This is because the plants themselves take up so much moisture here, and the hence temperature simply evaporate a lot of the water right off the surface of the soil, before it has a chance to soak in. As a result, it's very different to recharge the deep soil and groundwater system during the growing season. In terms of the, during the going season, when the temperatures are higher and plants are picking up water from the salt, the, the total moisture loss from top soil layers, Actually on adequate is much greater than what comes down the rainfall. This is because the plants themselves take up so much moisture here, and the hence temperature simply evaporate a lot of the water right off the surface of the soil, before it has a chance to soak in. As a result, it's very different to recharge the deep soil and groundwater system during the growing season. These studies that are going on at the moment, but the latest one which is, I find really exciting is working with family carers of people living with dementia. And we're actually showing the family carers how to use music in really strategic ways to support the care of the person that they're looking after. But we're also interested in preserving the relationship between the carer and the person that they're caring for, because one of the challenges for carers is that. When they're caring for someone and that person starts to forget who they are and stops recognizing them, the person with dementia doesn't give anything back. So, using music in a way that helps to bring that person to the present, 
these studies that are going on at the moment, but the latest one which is, I find really exciting is working with family carers of people living with dementia. And we're actually showing the family carers how to use music in really strategic ways to support the care of the person that they're looking after. But we're also interested in preserving the relationship between the carer and the person that they're caring for, because one of the challenges for carers is that when they're caring for someone and that person starts to forget who they are and stops recognizing them, the person with dementia doesn't give anything back. So, using music in a way that helps to bring that person to the present. So it's this short-term trading window at the start of each weekday, where for 5 minutes, the largest banks in Australia would trade these short-term loans, these IOUs. And by trading them, they're kind of saying, I'm willing to pay this interest rate, or I'm willing to buy this short-term loan for this price, which helps determine the interest rate. And then once that rate is set through that window, that is the rate for the day. So it's this short-term trading window at the start of each weekday, where for 5 minutes, the largest banks in Australia would trade these short-term loans, these IOUs. And by trading them, they're kind of saying, I'm willing to pay this interest rate, or I'm willing to buy this short-term loan for this price, which helps determine the interest rate. And then once that rate is set through that window, that is the rate for the day. In Russia, in Turkey, in Hungary, in a number of other places, authoritarian leaders or liberal democrats are attacking universities because universities are free institutions. Once you've attacked a free press, once you've attacked the courts, what's your next attack point? It's going to be a university. So we see what's happening in Hungary as part of a much wider global pattern, and that's why I think it should be of concern to Australians. In Russia, in Turkey, in Hungary, in a number of other places, authoritarian leaders or liberal democrats are attacking universities because universities are free institutions. Once you've attacked a free press, once you've attacked the courts, what's your next attack point? It's going to be a university. So we see what's happening in Hungary as part of a much wider global pattern, and that's why I think it should be of concern to Australians. I want to delve deeper into the world of the molecules because that's where you do your work. Your speciality is protein assemblies, you look at the way DNA repairs itself, and this is all happening at the level of the cell, at the level of molecules and, of course, proteins. So you've buried yourself into what they call structural biology. I want to delve deeper into the world of the molecules because that's where you do your work. Your speciality is protein assemblies, you look at the way DNA repairs itself, and this is all happening at the level of the cell, at the level of molecules and, of course, proteins. So you've buried yourself into what they call structural biology. Birds actually evolved after mammals approximately 50 to 100 million years after mammals. So mammals are actually older than birds. Mammals actually did even evolve from reptiles. They evolved from a stem amniote ancestor and reptiles also evolved from a stem amniote amphibian-like ancestor. <laughs> 
So we have to get rid of this idea of mammals being more advanced than birds and so forth. All that has to be thrown out the window. Birds actually evolved after mammals approximately 50 to 100 million years after mammals. So mammals are actually older than birds. Mammals actually didn't even evolve from reptiles. They evolved from a stem amniote ancestor and reptiles also evolved from a stem amniote amphibian-like ancestor. So we have to get rid of this idea of mammals being more advanced than birds and so forth. All that has to be thrown out the window. On a tour of Spain in 1912, a fellow traveler introduced Holst to astrology, and he became so curious that sowed the seeds of his spectacular orchestral suite. The planets, his most popular if not most representative of creation, which portrays the astrological rather than the mythological characters of seven planets in our solar system. Jupiter the bringer of jollity has both of its jovial feet planted firmly on the ground. On a tour of Spain in 1912, a fellow traveler introduced Holst to astrology, and he became so curious that sowed the seeds of his spectacular orchestral suite. The planets, his most popular if not most representative of creation, which portrays the astrological rather than the mythological characters of seven planets in our solar system. Jupiter the bringer of jollity has both of its jovial feet planted firmly on the ground. Well, it's a contested concept, and like many contested concepts, I think you can identify an agreed-upon core and then a sort of contested penumbra. I think that perhaps the agreed-upon core might be this. It's something held at once by academics and by academic institutions, and it is something like a privilege of freedom in the way in which the conduct of teaching and research is undertaken. Well, it's a contested concept, and like many contested concepts, I think you can identify an agreed-upon core and then a sort of contested penumbra. I think that perhaps the agreed-upon core might be this. It's something held at once by academics and by academic institutions, and it is something like a privilege of freedom in the way in which the conduct of teaching and research is undertaken. When you get hired somewhere, think about the company and think about the culture. Does it match who you are? For me, I loved aviation and I decided this is where I belonged. But the culture where I was didn't exactly match what I wanted to do. I'm not saying that a culture is good or bad because you can't think of culture in terms of countries. You can think of culture in terms of parts of the country, East Coast versus West Coast. I'm a West Coast person, that is also part of my culture piece which was also a bit of a challenge, because where I ended up was on the East Coast. When you get hired somewhere, think about the company and think about the culture. Does it match who you are? For me, I loved aviation and I decided this is where I belonged. But the culture where I was didn't exactly match what I wanted to do. I'm not saying that a culture is good or bad because you can't think of culture in terms of countries. You can think of culture in terms of parts of the country, East Coast versus West Coast. I'm a West Coast person, that is also part of my culture piece which was also a bit of a challenge, because where I ended up was on the East Coast. <laughs> 
Introduction to the history of psychology begins with a course, Why Study the History of Psychology? And I'd like to discuss several factors that are important to this. Because of course, as a formal discipline psychology came about in about 1879, and we, we tend to say with the founding of Wilhelm Wundt's laboratory in Leipzig, however, we need to also understand that the concerns of psychology were around will before this date. And therefore it helps to look at what historians have to say about how we go back in time and look at our past. So then when one begins to say why study the history of psychology, you can really hone in on four principles. Introduction to the history of psychology begins with a course, Why Study the History of Psychology? And I'd like to discuss several factors that are important to this. Because of course, as a formal discipline psychology came about in about 1879, and we, we tend to say with the founding of Wilhelm Wundt's laboratory in Leipzig, however, we need to also understand that the concerns of psychology were around will before this date. And therefore it helps to look at what historians have to say about how we go back in time and look at our past. So then when one begins to say why study the history of psychology, you can really hone in on four principles. This is a public housing property where we know the property was contaminated through use. The mother, the carer and a daughter that moved into this property, once they realized and remembered that it was drug users being in that property, they asked the housing authority to test and it came back positive. The whole family had a whole bunch of health effects, very consistent between them, respiratory effects, skin rashes, sleep problems, behavioral changes. There's none of these reports of getting any highs or anything nice from methamphetamine. It's all the bad parts of it. This is a public housing property where we know the property was contaminated through use. The mother, the carer and a daughter that moved into this property, once they realized and remembered that it was drug users being in that property, they asked the housing authority to test and it came back positive. The whole family had a whole bunch of health effects, very consistent between them, respiratory effects, skin rashes, sleep problems, behavioral changes. There's none of these reports of getting any highs or anything nice from methamphetamine. It's all the bad parts of it. It was autumn last year, the night of March 31st, 2018. A full moon was lighting up the ocean and the surf was rolling in. A father called Min and his teenage son were fishing off the rocks at Winding Island, just south of Wollongong. It's a notoriously dangerous spot, with strong currents on either side of the island. Local surfers call it smack on some days waves get as big as 25 feet. At around 10 p.m. that night, something went terribly wrong. It was autumn last year, the night of March 31st, 2018. A full moon was lighting up the ocean and the surf was rolling in. A father called Min and his teenage son were fishing off the rocks at Winding Island, just south of Wollongong. It's a notoriously dangerous spot, with strong currents on either side of the island. Local surfers call it smack on some days waves get as big as 25 feet. At around 10 p.m. that night, something went terribly wrong. There is no consistent legal definition of hate crime across the country. For example in Queensland, a person must not incite or threaten violence towards a person on the grounds of their race, religion, sexuality or gender identity. And in New South Wales, it's the same. 
but it's also against the law to threaten or incite violence towards a person based on their HIV status. In Tasmania, the NT and the ACT, racial vilification isn't a criminal act. But a murder is a murder in the eyes of the law, whether it's motivated by racism or not. And an assault is an assault regardless of whether the perpetrator is motivated by Islamophobia, homophobia, or any other prejudice. There is no consistent legal definition of hate crime across the country, for example in Queensland, a person must not incite or threaten violence, towards a person on the grounds of their race, religion, sexuality or gender identity. And in New South Wales, it's the same, but it's also against the law to threaten or incite violence towards a person based on their HIV status. In Tasmania, the NT and the ACT, racial vilification isn't a criminal act. But a murder is a murder in the eyes of the law, whether it's motivated by racism or not. And an assault is an assault regardless of whether the perpetrator is motivated by Islamophobia, homophobia, or any other prejudice. They may be our cousins, but orangutans and other primates are nowhere near humans in terms of technological achievement, social organization, or culture. And it's humans' capacity for building off of one another, an integral part of our so-called cumulative culture, that has allowed us to build up so much in so little time. But how did we develop such advanced methods of learning in the first place? Kevin Lalland of the University of St. Andrews spoke with me about his team's quest to pinpoint the social and cognitive processes that underlie humans' ability to acquire and transmit knowledge. They may be our cousins, but orangutans and other primates are nowhere near humans in terms of technological achievement, social organization, or culture. And it's humans' capacity for building off of one another, an integral part of our so-called cumulative culture, that has allowed us to build up so much in so little time. But how did we develop such advanced methods of learning in the first place? Kevin Lalland of the University of St. Andrews spoke with me about his team's quest to pinpoint the social and cognitive processes that underlie humans' ability to acquire and transmit knowledge. I will try to have the practice. After class ends if you want to continue the discussion, you have some questions that occurred to you towards the end, didn't have a chance to share them with the class as a whole. I will, on a normal day, meet outside and continue to talk with, however many of you want to do that, until you're done. I will try to have the practice. After class ends if you want to continue the discussion, you have some questions that occurred to you towards the end, didn't have a chance to share them with the class as a whole. I will, on a normal day, meet outside and continue to talk with, however many of you want to do that, until you're done. <laughs> 